The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I just need to make sure. Tom, are you on? Say something to me because I'm not sure we can hear you. You, you sound right, very. Maybe he sounds very far away. I do. No, Tom does. Is it better? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. I think we're good to go. Sorry for that little technical dis difficulty. Um, when we're trying to coordinate people from all different locations, it's a little more challenging. Good afternoon. My name is Sally Samuels. I'm Director of Compliance at FAME, and we're so glad that you were able to join us this afternoon. We have some great people on our panel, very knowledgeable people that certainly can give you a little insight on what to expect, what's next, what to do, and whatever. So. We're, we're hoping to give you some alternatives. Uh, this COVID-19 is just devastated, not only our country, but everybody else around the world, our schools, our students, and um, we just don't want you to panic. There are things you can do to try to make things easier, and uh, you do have some options out there. You have to be very careful with those options and make sure you stay in compliance. The Department of Education did send an electronic announcement on 3 5 uh, 2020 and another one on 3 20 2020. So that, uh, and they also have a uh, web page just devoted to this information. So those are some resources for you. We are not going over that, either one of those dear colleagues, step by step, obviously. Tom Netting is uh, Chief Executive Officer of 10 Government Strategies in Washington, D.C. He's going to give you a little overview of what's happening in Washington right now and anything else he can give us some insight on regarding this uh, crisis that we're going through. We have uh, Dr. Tony Miranda, and I skipped the pictures because Tony's going to be the second one to go, and he's going to talk about accreditation and what uh, Department of Ed is allowing accreditation to do during this period and also probably some things that are NACA specific. And we also have Greg Michael John. Greg is out there to help you with these enrollments during this period because obviously we don't want to lose students, although we may lose a few, but we definitely have to keep the enrollments rolling. Otherwise, we don't have any future students. So he's going to finish up and I'm going to go right after Tony and just tell you the financial aid implications. Um, when we're done, I'm gonna do a little quick wrap up and then we're going to open it to questions and answers and hopefully we can get everything covered today. Mm -hmm. If we don't get all your answers covered today, we can post them on the FAME uh, website so that you can see anything that we didn't get covered here. All right, Tom, take it away. Uh, thank you, Sally, and thank you to FAME uh, for putting together this panel and uh, uh, individuals. I'm looking forward to hearing and learning some of the information from uh, some of the other panelists today as things kind of uh, change uh, right now pretty much uh, daily, if not hourly. Um, in an attempt to try and just give you where we sit at 303 on uh, March 23rd, uh, I'm going to start on the legislative side and talk a little bit about some of the can executive you speak orders a little and louder, Tom? on the Trump administration. Hello? Tom, can you speak a little louder? You're a little garbled and a little hard to hear. Uh, Sally, I'm literally have the phone pressed up against my, up against my, my cheek. I don't know how much better I That's can do. Better. Is this okay? That's better. Thank you. Okay. Um, as I was saying, once again, thank you to FAME for putting this panel together and giving me the opportunity to help. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of information from the Trump administration, some of their executive actions and uh, guidance that they put forward, transition uh, into a little bit of what is going on up on Capitol Hill, recognizing that with so many things right now that, as I said at the beginning, uh, and as I'm sure we'll talk about throughout the course of this webinar, uh, things are changing pretty rapidly uh, as states make different decisions and the Trump administration uh, provides additional guidance on a daily basis. Um, in terms of what the administration has done thus far, that is of important note. Uh, first and foremost, from a perspective of the students, uh, I'm sure you all have witnessed and seen uh, by now the actions taken by the Trump administration to freeze all student borrowing uh, requirements in terms of repayment options, uh, not only the interest rate accrual on student loans, but also uh, in the announcements that have gone out 
providing students with the opportunity to also, for a period of 60 days, freeze any repayment options that uh, are required of the individuals. There are nuances to address different portions of opportunities for students to continue to pay if they so choose, whether that be in order uh, for a number of different reasons to continue to work towards their progression of public service loan forgiveness and the incremental number of payments that are required, the ability to continue to pay simply in order to, if they have the capability and the financial means to do so, to pay down portions of the accruing interest as well as principal, depending on how much accrued interest has come into their loans. And uh, But the bottom line is that individuals now have, starting from March 13th, last Friday, a week ago, two weeks ago almost, a week and a half ago now, to uh, prevent having to pay for uh, pay, uh, their, their payments for their student loans. Um, in addition, uh, what is being considered by the administration are other changes uh, to affect the whole in which uh, other portions of delivery are being done. The loan servicers and collectors have received information uh, alluding to the fact that loans should be frozen uh, in uh, forbearance for these periods of time. Uh, there are a number of questions as to what that means uh, for the servicers to continue who are basically the service and collection aspect, but uh, that's not as relevant to us, so I'll just leave that alone for right now. Uh, but suffice it to say that right now there are a number of questions that then uh, trickle down from the notion that students are going to have their capabilities frozen for a period of time. An uh, important side note there is that the students should either contact their loan servicers if in fact they are looking to uh, utilize that 60-day period or the ser loan servicers will be contacting them and attempting to provide them with additional information and encourage them either to choose to do so if they need based on their financial circumstances to forego payments or encourage them to pay again for the opportunity to bring down accrued interest and uh, potentially principal. With regard to Congress, uh, there have been two pieces of legislation already passed. Those pieces of legislation have made several efforts and have spent literally trillions of dollars now uh, in funding from uh, emergency options, which do not fall under the normal purview of appropriations, so they're off the books, if you will, in terms of uh, overall federal spending. <laughs> they have been done in the interest of attempting to protect small businesses, a number of the different types of, in, of entities uh, that are finding themselves continuing to be more and more shuttered, uh, literally as well as figuratively, and losing funding and revenue as a result. Uh, obviously, the major portion of both of those bills has been focused on the pandemic itself, how to provide the needed and necessary resources for all of healthcare to try and work their way through the pandemic uh, and other funding sources. Neither of those really focused heavily on interest and access for education. Instead, the department left the department was left to do that through uh, the limited guidance that was provided for by the Trump administration. But Congress is working towards a third bill, or what they're calling the phase three stimulus package, that will have a considerable number of proposals related to higher education policy. The three that I think are most um, important to our community is one whole group that will further address student borrower relief and go will likely go further than the present Trump administration executive order. What is being contemplated by Congress is the ability to uh, prevent interest from accruing on loans and provide for a lack of loan repayment unless choosing to do so for a period of three to six months, a three-month increment and then another three-month increment depending on the length of the pandemic and uh, the circumstances of how long this uh, will continue to play out as we all look 
to hunker down and try and flatten the curve, as we all hear on the pundits talk about on all of the media outlets. Second portion of that deals with the ability to continue education while the pandemic is ongoing. There are certainly a number of states that are announcing uh, extended closures, including Pennsylvania and, his, and the governor there, who literally just announced moments before we got on this call, uh, a continuation of uh, the inability for schools, all schools within the, in the state, uh, to do much, if any, education actually on campus throughout a minimum April 6th, so extending it for another two weeks. Uh, each state is different, uh, so we need to track individually, and I know FAME, and I know all the state associations, as well as uh, a number of the national organizations are all trying to keep up with all of the information that is provided there. But what Congress is also doing, and this is perhaps the most important of the three that is in what started out as a Senate Republican bill, but is now fastly becoming a much bigger stimulus bill that includes Democrats and Republicans who have worked on it over the weekend, is a provision that would allow for the Department of Education to have extensive latitude to waive the normal statute and regulations related to higher education policy. We all recognize that there is going to be a considerable ripple effect, is probably a nice word, for all of the concerns around going on that we're living as a result of the inability to provide on-ground and campus education, to provide specific clinics, as well as salon or other clock hour environment training and education, as well as questions about what to do with enrollments uh, post uh, the initial guidance that was provided by the department that Sally touched on briefly in her opening remarks uh, back on March 5th and the new guidance that was posted just Friday evening, March 20th. Long-winded way of saying we are tracking uh, the and Congress is tracking and listening to a great deal of requests for um, latitude and flexibility to ultimately be provided back to the Department of Education. Why is this so key? And then I'll turn it back over to Sally and to, to Dr. Mirando, because uh, I think it'll be a good segue, is because a number of the issues related to the standards and how the triads operate are you know, in a state of flux right now, giving institutions greater capabilities to utilize modalities off campus. That includes not only the normal and customary concepts of online and distance learning, but new opportunities that have been afforded and guidance provided by the department to try and even bridge the gap for a short time in terms of emails being the direct contact between the institution and the, the faculty and the students or other paradigms that are far short of the synchronous and asynchronous environments that we normally and traditionally have thought about in terms of online education. A number of our vendors and third-party servicers are helping schools in that transition for a short or what may be a longer period of time during the pandemic and states as well as the accreditors and others are providing their guidance and providing additional information on how to bridge that period of time, however long it may be, with uh, no one having a date certain of when that is going to end. But the good news is that the Department of Education in the most recent guidance talked for the first time about new enrollment, which does indicate the ability for institutions to continue to move forward and not stagnate based only on present enrollments as things go forward. Uh, which is uh, a blessing because a number of institutions were very much concerned that the initial guidance didn't uh, contemplate the continuation of education even under these limited or modified circumstances. So providing that new information last Friday and people gain, gaining access to it over the weekend and really starting to dig into it today, I think are another favorable um, uh, proviso uh, that has been provided right now. Uh, before I close, the statute is not completed yet, but Congress is moving quickly to complete the legislation uh, that they're working on that includes these opportunities for uh, flexibility within the Department of Education uh, without a crystal ball, but knowing how quickly Congress 
move the prior two pieces, but recognizing that this is now over a $2 trillion proposal. Um, Congress is paying specific attention to uh, a lot of the things that are going into it. As a result, I think that it will probably be uh, enacted into law by Tuesday or Wednesday, tomorrow or Wednesday of this week, but certainly by the end of the week. And through fame, uh, I will share, and I'm sure others will share when this becomes an acted, uh, acted statute and what that means for both uh, the flexibility to seek waivers of the department on issues related to financial responsibility, administrative capability, and other things that I'm sure we'll get into in the question and answer. Uh, so in trying to keep this to 10 to 15 minutes, Sally, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Dr. Tony Miranda, as you know, is Executive Director of NACUS, and he's going to give us the little um, overview from the accreditation side. Tony? Thank you, Sally. Good afternoon, everybody. These are very trying times, and I'm hoping that uh, over the next 10 minutes or so that uh, I can add a little bit of uh, um, clearance of uh, what it is that we all would like you all to uh, stay in compliance with with NACUS. There's a lot going on. As Sally mentioned, um, we received uh, two letters from the U.S. Department of Education. Um, one was uh, this past Friday, um, and the original one was March 4th or 5th. Um, and this letter to the institutions really was um, the beginning of uh, allowing the schools to formulate a process to try to save um, and, and provide um, seat time to their students um, in the programs that they offer and is accredited by NACUS. The, um, the new term that we're using right now to help uh, keep um, things separated um, from our normal process is that the department calls this new process a temporary distance education and it's important that people understand that this is indeed temporary um, it's a it's a stopgap measure that was put in place um, in order to help fill the time um, that students potentially could lose as a result of COVID-19 um, NACAS has put into place a application and it has changed over the last couple of three days as things are changing. So we have to always make sure that we understand things are fluid right now and uh, we're working as fast as we can and as diligently as we can to ensure that we are, you know, helping schools get this um, application filled out. So as the Department of, Edu of Education mentioned, um, they were um, allowing schools to use this temporary distance education process uh, in lieu of seat time. And that's really important for our schools because it's quite different than traditional colleges and universities where they're using, you know, they have uh, credit hours because where clock hours is a little bit of difference here. And so please um, pay close attention to the difference. So um, they've allowed also the accreditors to modify their process um, for allowing distance education through this temporary distance education, also known as TDE. Uh, NACUS uh, very quickly um, spent a lot of energy and time um, developing this new process. We, we have been able to streamline it, and over the last week, we have literally uh, received close to 700 applications. And for the most part, as of yesterday, um, we were 90 plus percent um, um, on time. We've reviewed them and hopefully most people have re heard from us. If you've not heard from us, please contact me. This process has been streamlined from a three to four month process down to three days. So you can imagine the amount of hard work that has gone into this. And uh, we feel like since we're part of this industry, um, we have been for 50 years that um, we, we, we really needed to step up and get this done, and I believe we've, we've met the demand. Um, there are definitely some Title IV implications um, to using this TDE, and I'm hoping that Sally, uh, Sally will go over some of that. Um, the important pieces that I want people to pay attention to are as follows. 
I know a lot of people have been asking, um, when can you use this TDE? And for the most part, I've been breaking it down into you can use it for two reasons. One, that you've closed your school as a result of either your state, local municipality, or the federal government has asked you to close your school um, as a result of COVID-19. Um, and so uh, we originally requested people send in documentation, but um, we're good that way. We don't need any more. I think we're all feeling very comfortable that if you close your school, you've met that requirement. The second is that if your school is still open, and you have some students who have been either quarantined or they're home with COVID-19 or they're taking care of um, uh, family members with COVID-19, you can also provide the TDE to them. But what you cannot do is have your school, your brick and mortar school open and offer both brick and mortar or the TDE just because you want to have it as an option. We are not allowing that, and I don't believe the, the Department of Ed is either. Um, how long can you use this TDE? Right now, from what we have um, received as guidance from the Department of Ed, and again, maybe Sally will go over this later, is that it's the current payment period that you're in and the immediate one following. So I know a lot of people have said to me, is there's a 30-day approval, is there a 60-day approval? It's actually whatever payment period you're in and the one fo immediately following it. And again, it is only temporary. Um, the um, Another question has come out is when your school closes and you have not yet begun the TDE, how do you handle this with respect to your students? Do you consider them a drop? Um, and what I've told people is, you know, we got to have a little bit of common sense right now. If you close your school and you don't offer this TDE, um, treat it as if your school had closed because of a hurricane or a tornado or a bad snowstorm, and meaning that when your students come back in, look at their contracts and adjust their contracts uh, based on the additional days that they're going to need that they missed. Can you use an LOA? Well, right now it's a little bit gray on that. I would suggest that Again, you, you talk to your, uh, your, your Title IV person, um, but if your school is open, meaning that you can, can continue to uh, teach at the brick and mortar, or you're offering this TDE, because if you have a TDE program and you're actually using it, you're no longer closed anymore. For NACUS, you are now open and operating, but a student doesn't want to participate um, but they're not sick or not taking care of somebody or not being quarantined, then you would either use an LOA or you would drop them. People have asked me, well, hey, Dr. Miranda, I don't allow LOAs. Is that something we can do right now? And of course, the answer is you can submit something to me, a petition for a variance, allow you to email it to me, or you can upload it into the, the owner portal like you did for your TD application, and we will um, we will process it as soon as possible. Again, um, you you could do that through the portal or email. You do not have to send it in. Um, with respect to um, uh, NACUS, just again, want to make sure that people understand if you do close. Um, in in accordance with 5.3 of our rules, you have an obligation to let us know that you've closed. An email will be fine. You don't have to send anything in formally, just an email letting me know. Please put your reference number when you're closing, when you anticipate opening, um, and just keep me informed. I will send you a response email. It'll give you some other information that you need to pay attention to, such as uh, NACUS's policy on disaster, which is 8.01 of the rules um, of our policy. Um, and it will give you a breakdown as to the additional things that you'll you'll be required to submit to NACUS. But right now, it's uh, we're as long as it's not with uh, it's not over 30 days, that information is not necessary yet. But please pay attention to it. The important thing to remember is to initially notify us, put your your reference number um, in the email. Again, as I said, make sure you tell us when you're closing, when you think you're going to be opening up. 
Um, and, and, and again, if you're teaching the distance ed via the temporary, you are not considered to be closed. And that's a really important piece. NACA schools are clock hour schools, so please ensure that your TDE platform um, is taking that into consideration, which means you are somewhat responsible for seat time still. Um, I know that um, uh, uh, Tom Netting um, alluded to that there's a lot of leeway here right now, and that is a true statement. There is some leeway here, um, but I really do think um, to ensure that you are going to have no problems later on receiving payments, um, that you document, document, document whatever you're using, whether you're on a, a Milady um, or a Pivot Point platform or some other creative method of ensuring that these students are receiving their education, um, having documentation and how you're doing that um, is very, very important. And I would consider ensuring that you can document it over the 15-minute period. Um, I don't know if one or two emails a day is going to suffice here. So again, I like to be more conservative to make sure that things are happening. Um, please try to um, ensure that you have a good, a good process in place, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. Um, there are lots of modes of delivery out there that are effectively um, ensuring that you're keeping in contact with your students. Like I said, whether you're on a Milady or a Pivot Point, and I would say, you know, that covers 99% of our schools or, or somewhere in the 90s. Um, they have lots and lots of different um, uh, aspects to their platform where you could have um, very interactive communication with your students. Please use all those resources and keep it all documented. Um, the other issue that I think is really important and worth mentioning is that NACIS has, and right now, only able to, per, um, uh, to approve a 50% um, of your uh, clock hours for your program to be done via distance education through this uh, temporary distance ed. We have been in close contact with uh, with, uh, with Ed on providing us with a temporary waiver of that 50%, but unfortunately um, it's, it has to go all the way to the top to get that. And so we're waiting very, very uh, enthusiastically to hear back from them. Um, I check in every day. So just again, please remember the 50% rule. Now, when I say that, as Tom alluded to, you know, there's this triad thing. And what's really, really important, even when you read the Department of Ed's letters, is that the the, the state boards or your state licensing agency um, plays a very, very, very important role here. It doesn't make a difference what the Department of Ed says. It doesn't make a difference what NACA says. If, you're, if your state does not allow for distance ed, it doesn't make a difference. You cannot use it. Um, if they allow for 10% and we say 50%, you're still only allowed to do 10%. Another piece which is really, really important to, to make note of, and that is, are there any restrictions even within the distance ed that your state does permit? Initially, NACIS had a restriction that you could only do theory. Um, over the past week, I have um, uh, met with the commission. We've we've gotten that changed. So temporarily, right now, we're waiving that rule and allowing for both theory and practical. However, there are many many states that are not allowing that. So please check in with your with your state for two things. One, what percentage of your program, if any, and two, are there any restrictions for for just being theory? or and or practical. Um, and again, any of our approval letters that we're sending out, we're very, very clear. Doesn't really make a difference what Macus is saying when it comes to the percentage and the type of material that you're using. Your state is going to uh, is going to play a big part of that. Please don't get yourself into a predicament where you've done something where your state doesn't allow it. That will then put your students at risk when they go for sit for licensure. 
and another little piece with that, um, which is very much well, 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 very much worth noting again, I apologize, is making sure that if you have any students that plan to go to another state when they graduate, that's not only just your state, but the state that they're going to. You want to make sure that they're not going to get themselves caught up in a predicament where they they graduate from your school and then they can't sit for licensure in the state that they intended to go to. Um, a couple of other things, mode of delivery. Again, um, in your in your contract, most people don't talk about that, but it is important that if you do talk about a mode of delivery, meaning brick and mortar and or distance ed, that the student is aware of that, you may have to correct your contract for that. Also, schedules. Um, again, in your contract, you have schedules and whether they're doing full-time, part-time, number of hours, all of those things need to be updated and the students need to sign off on that because you don't want to get yourself in a predicament where the contract and what you're doing with them is different. And of course, if you're changing, if you're changing your contract, please check in with um, your, 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 your provider for Title IV to make sure they're aware of any changes that you're making. A few other little things um, with respect to the office um, before I hand it back over to Sally. If you have been given a directive to come to the office, and please make sure that you get in contact with us because we are no longer doing the in-person consultations um, or either canceling them or requiring you to do um, phone consultations. You can contact either me or my assistant, Melissa, and, um, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Also, um, if, you've been, if you have any site visits in March or April, and I put a big question mark even now for May, um, those visits um, will either be canceled or have been canceled. Again, March and April have been canceled, May may be canceled. And again, we'll reach back out to you at a later date to give you your new dates but just note that um, we are canceling those visits. Um, just again, a reminder, those of you who are asking for this temporary um, uh, distance ed, um, once you send in the application and that application is online and it has changed, it's actually even smaller now, um, they, we are getting to those within three days. We work through the weekend um, and we're, we're, we're pretty much up on target. Um, and we will continue to um, to do them as soon as they come in, as soon as we can get a, a person humanly possible to fill them out and get you back your information. Uh, and again, don't forget about your notifying NACIS that you're closed. Um, please let us know if you're closed. And again, the closing means you're not doing either brick and mortar or the online. For now, until June 1st, um, uh, we will, be accepting scanned applications and forms um, up through the owner portal like you sent in the application for the distance set instead of the using the FedEx or UPS or United States Postal Service. Again, you can submit those things through the owner portal for now. Um, we know that some of those services and we don't want you to go out to those areas and, um, and violate the, the uh, social gathering. We're also Thank requesting you, that an all not we'll get two more things and I'll let you go. Two other things. The non-essential application forms. Um, if anybody has any of those, please do not send them in. We're inundated right now. So if you can hold off sending in those right now, I please I ask that you please do so. And the last and final thing is that we know that as a result of COVID-19, lots of things are going to be happening with your student outcomes your financials, and maybe lots of other standards. Um, we will be addressing those in the near future, and we will be getting back to people as soon as possible on those, those uh, outcomes or those decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Miranda. I just want to mention, uh, for those of you that are not NACIS accredited, every single accrediting agency out there is going to work with you. They all are following similar guidelines. If you go to their websites, they will uh, tell you what you have to do to get temporary approval through them. 
they also have uh, posted things and they're sending out information to you. So all the accrediting agencies are basically working similar. I'm not gonna say exactly the same. They all have their own rules, they all have their own forms, and they all have their own process. But just know there is help out there from every single one of them and they're all bending over backwards to try to assist you. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some things that you should know. First of all is you need to tell Department of Education if you're closing and you need to tell them it's temporary. You don't want them to think that you are not going to reopen and start the whole closed school process. So it is your requirement to let them know that you're going to close. And I would say that if you plan on trying to do distance ed, I know some of you are scrambling and have already had to close because of state, state mandates. And by the time you scramble and get ready to do your distance ed, it may be that you're already open again. Who knows? That's the best case scenario. But uh, meanwhile, you do need to let Department of Ed know you're closing. And if you have not updated your eCar with current contact information, you need to do that because they don't want to call a school and not be able to get rid of uh, get in touch with any single content contact that's on that list. So be sure they have emails, phone numbers, how to get a hold of you, and that should have already been part of your process. Um, tell them it's a temporary closure if you plan on doing distance ed. I have some schools that have just said they're going to be closed for three weeks uh, until they can reopen. And they were hopeful that in three weeks they could reopen. But at some point, you know, this may turn out to be a two or three month period. We have no idea at this point. We hope not. But we have to do whatever's safe for our students and our schools. Um, so meanwhile, Notify Ed that you're going to close temporarily and that you, if you plan on doing distance ed, say at the same time, I'm applying for distance education with my accrediting in state so that they know that you plan on doing something with those students. Then, of course, your next step is state and accrediting approval. As Tony's mentioned, please pay attention to your state requirements. I've seen on the X uh, listserv, some states will only allow you to do 10 hours. Well, 10 hours isn't much. It's maybe an hour a day. So you have to, or, you know, two hours a day, five days, two hours a day. So you have to be sure that if that's all they allow you to do is distance ed, that's all you're going to be able to do, regardless of what the accrediting says you can do. So you have to be sure to follow those state guidelines. As uh, Dr. Miranda mentioned, there are several, several platforms out there. Milady, Pivot Point, uh, I've heard you can do Google Classroom. You can do Zoom, you can do uh, go to meeting, um, any type of a webinar thing, uh, anything that gets your students face to face if you're a clock hour school is certainly better because now you know how long they've been in attendance and you don't have to worry. I know some of those other platforms actually have a barcode that the student can scan so you know what time they clocked in and how long they were on and when they're clocking out, that type of thing. So there's a lot of things out there that you can do. Um, now that you can also enroll up through June and as long as the students start, you wanna be sure that you, know, you, you keep those enrollments going and Greg is gonna talk about that in a few minutes. Um, you do not need to get Ed's approval for your temporary distance Ed program, but it's simple courtesy to notify them. You can send them an email and say that you now are doing uh, temporary distance Ed and you've been approved by state and accrediting. That way you're just staying in contact with them. They know that you're doing something. They know you just haven't closed your doors because they're not gonna know what's going on. And just like during hurricanes, they use those contact numbers to try to reach you and find out, are you active? What are you doing and how are you handling this? Um, they did mention that you do not have to do synchronous for clock hour, but you do have to be able to tell, as Tony mentioned, that that student was actively involved for 50 minutes. They did say in the Dear Colleague letter, you could do emails, but emails means you need more than just an email sending the, the uh, requirements out to the student. You could send the coursework out to the student by email, but after that, you need to have some ongoing attendance, whether it's a group chat, whether it's uh, correspondence back and forth between the instructor, whatever it is, you need to have ongoing substantive interaction with your students, just as most distance education requires. Um, 
if you've closed and you're not currently doing distance ed because you don't have your approvals, uh, if FAME is your third-party servicer for drawing your funds, you have to let us know not to order cash. You do that through Nancy McCallum at nancymccallum at fameinc.com. Uh, we already sent a notice to all of our schools that we do process, so you should have been aware of that, but that's just a reminder. Then once you have your distance ed approvals uh, for the temporary time, you need to send both state and accrediting to FAME so that we know to process you and then, then we know to start drawing your funds again for new students or for second payments when you update attendance and let us know the student is due for that next payment period. Um, there are some other things out there that, that FAME is trying to do to keep you current. Um, we have a dedicated hotline. It's our 1-800-327-5772, option one. We do have customer service and other people manning that to try to help you with your questions. They may not know all the answers. Quite honestly, we don't know all the answers. Uh, the Department of Ed is sending stuff out. They're doing updates. Um, Tom and some other groups are sending questions into the department to try to get some answers from the powers that be. And then Department of Ed will keep updating too. Uh, you can do chat, like I said, FAME is doing chat so that you can uh, contact our customer service people through chat. We also have partnered with um, uh, online uh, testing group, Dialog Ed, LMS, um, all of those are available and have some type of platforms that you can use or things that you can do. If you have the class app already, and we're not going to install new class apps because it's time consuming and you don't have that kind of time right now. But if you currently have the class app, you can send stuff out through that to your students and do some interaction with your students through the class app so that you can stay in contact with them and keep them updated on, you know, when you're starting to send stuff out, what's going out, um, make sure that they're participating in those types of things. The leave of absences are kind of iffy. We haven't gotten a lot of guidance on that. Um, my understanding is if you're doing online, temporary online, and the student can't do it because they don't have the equipment or they don't have internet, even though a lot of companies are providing free internet, internet it may not be strong enough. Internet's pretty challenged right now with everybody using it as much as they are. So students may have difficulty logging in, uh, picking stuff up, staying online. There's going to be a lot of complications there. So just be sure you stay in touch with them and, and we know what's going on. But um, you have to remember that that this is going to be a difficult time for us. So if the student can't participate, then I don't feel getting a leave of absence would be any problem. The problem is it has to have a start and end date. So you can't just say when we're back, on, uh, back in on the classroom you have to give it an end date. And then if things don't work out and you still can't open at that point, or the student themselves have the virus or the family member has the virus and they can't you know, come back to school at that time, you would have to extend the leave and it would have to be a, a addition, an additional signature requirement with a new deadline of when they're coming back. So that's the most important thing is you know, to remember to document everything, document how you're doing your online training, uh, who interacted, when you actually closed, when you actually started doing the temporary online, um, when you ceased doing the temporary online and went back to your normal classrooms. Dr. Miranda made a very important point. Once the state, county, whatever caused you to close, no longer says that you have to be closed down, whether it's a week from now, three weeks from now, a month from now. At that point, you have to go back to teaching in the classroom. You can't say, oh, well, we'll just do this for a little while longer because now we have the hang of it. We think we don't mind it. No, once classroom can be done again, you must switch back to the classroom. You may have some students that take a day or two to get back in there. And again, if they have the virus themselves or they're caring for a family member, then it's appropriate to do a leave of absence for them. And that leave of absence at this point can even be signed after the fact. Not a good idea because if they don't come back, you won't have the documentation. So again, if you have the class app or some other means for that student to uh, do something, go ahead and uh, 
answer in the format so that you've got the student signature. Email is not a valid leave of answer, a leave of absence. I just want to remind you of that, unless the student actually has uh, their own portal, or like the class app, they can sign it through that. But unless the student has their own portal, they cannot use um, that general email because anybody could access it to do a leave of absence. They can do a hard copy mail it back to you. I think most of you aren't going to want faxes back because you're not there. So um, uh, FAME is also updating their homepage with questions and answers so that you can see what's available. Anybody at FAME that you call will either answer your questions or move you to somebody that can. That includes anybody in consulting, customer service. Uh, those would be your two most likely piece, people to contact. Um, and we understand during this period, you may be suffering financial uh, problems. You've got no money coming in, no clinic revenue, if that's the type of school you're at, et cetera. So please, you need to communicate with us. Just contact Kathy Cahill at Accounts Receivable and uh, she'll work something out with you. We understand it's a very difficult time for everybody. We are your partners and we want to help you. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Greg Micklejohn so he can, he's a co-founder of Enrollment Strategies and he's going to uh, give us some tips about how to get our enrollments uh, remotely while we're in this downtime. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sally. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sir. Does the sound okay? Okay, good. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Mikkeljohn. I'm the uh, co-founder of Enrollment Resources. We've been uh, doing this work with career schools since 2003. And uh, we focus on making tiny iterative improvements to marketing and admissions and student retention using uh, lean management principles. So the whole theme is make tiny little improvements, do more with what you've got, and you get surprisingly excellent results. So I'm talking to you from that context versus, hey, go out and buy advertising, or hey, hire a bunch more people. So just so you have a, a sense of things here in my, in my conversation. Um, the talk, uh, the 10 minute or so overview that I'm gonna give is, um, based on some assumptions that I'd like you to take note of. And the first one being is that um, the ideas that I'm gonna share have not necessarily been uh, vetted with a lawyer or with uh, uh, Dr. Miranda or others in the reg or Sally in the regulatory side. So please, please, please double check that these uh, ideas and thoughts that I'm gonna be sharing can work within the structure of your accreditation um, limitations. For instance, uh, one of the assumptions I'm gonna make in terms of um, uh, beauty schools is that if you in fact are gonna be, uh, you know, uh, working, toward, working within the TDE uh, confines, um, that you will also be able to sign up new students for I'm, let's say September intake. So while you're working with an existing student body to, to create distance learning to help them grad out, right now we can use our uh, marketing and admissions levers to organize your intakes for August, September. That's under the assumption that the, uh, the social distancing that everyone is urging will loosen within the next few weeks. So that's the second uh, assumption that I'm gonna uh, run on here today is that the uh, this social distancing and the quarantine stuff that's going on is gonna last um, eight weeks max um, as the, the curve gets crushed. There's a point where it no longer can do its work and it'll then move into the second phase of this virus uh, and it'll run for a number of months of which we don't know, but life will get back to semi-normal, what I would say partial so social quarantine. So I'm gonna work on that assumption as well. So going forward, let's get at it. So phase one, here's some things to share. Um, go to your faculty and film their lectures, whatever um, programs you have, Allied Health or 
Cosmos schools, take your faculty and film their uh, their their lectures. And because I guarantee you, you've got about a what well, according to the experts, a 30, 40 percent chance that those faculty people will become positive and then they will have to quarantine for a couple of weeks at some point in the future. And so you need your faculty to deliver lectures. Um, this is a term you might have heard called flipping the classroom, uh, where, you know, uh, in the absence of the faculty, uh, you have people watching these on YouTube. And then the, the, uh, if, if the faculty are feeling okay, they can work with the students as a teaching assistant and pointing them to areas where they might be stuck, where the, the uh, lecture might help them. So flipping the classroom is something you should do immediately bank the lectures on video. You want to set up right away uh, uh, remote admissions processes. This is something that uh, in talking to colleagues such as Gene Norris and others that uh, this is coming down the pipe. And, and so the old way, if you will, the, the uh, old way being early March, you have uh, people on the phone with a, a five minute maybe 10 minute conversation on the phone with a primary uh, desire to push people to a, a long meeting in an office at a school. And the nature of how students um, purchase education now is that they are deep into getting uh, uh, referrals, uh, reviews, doing deep um, complex research themselves. And so uh, these people are really not leads, like you hear some ad agencies call them, they're explorers. They're exploring uh, a life change. And so what the, the new best practice that we're promoting is um, to have a discovery session with explorers. And these discovery sessions should be 30 to 45 minutes uh, in length on the phone. And uh, in getting good at this, uh, you might find that you will not want to necessarily go back to the old way of marketing and admissions. You may want to adopt this as your new best practice. And um, there's an opportunity in having a good high quality phone meeting, which has really been well established um, uh, in the, the, uh, um, by the distance education schools, such as University of Phoenix and Grand Canyon and many of these other schools. Um, there are pieces to creating an ideal remote admissions process. And um, here's some little tricks, okay? So the first thing you want to do is obviously uh, train up your reps on screen shares. So uh, Uber Conference, Zoom, you've heard of, um, Start Meeting, Go to Meeting, these kinds of tools. They're inexpensive and they're easy to learn. And you can bring a prospective student up and you can share screens together. So the second thing you want to do is you want to uh, get your smartphones out and you want to uh, uh, go and, uh, and interview some of your best faculty. The, uh, the faculty have uh, um, credibility and influence in a spectrum of uh, influencing prospective students. So go and interview your people, um, the, your, 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 educational leaders, little 60 second YouTube videos, and then stack them up in your own little YouTube channel. And so when an admissions rep is, uh, is uh, going and uh, um, talking with a prospective student and explorer, they can say, hey, would you like to just watch a 60 second video on our, our, um, our phlebotomy teacher, Mrs. Anderson, and then bloop, bring her up and then you can have tours of your school you can go here's the phlebotomy testing room here's uh, Betty our receptionist or what have you so uh, I can hear someone snoring actually on the call uh, can you Sally no no okay good um, so that those are the, the the primary levers and then you know not to be self uh, promoting but we have a, a a remote admission software discipline package that we're actually giving away in the time of COVID. So uh, we have 43 
school systems right now that we're setting up um, on with our, our software, which is basically a forced a discipline of best practice. Um, there are other companies that can offer, not many, but uh, Norton Norris, I believe, have a, a, a somewhat similar kind of a system. And it just basically, it's an anchor to ask all the correct questions and properly qualify explorers to see if they're ready for school. Now, if you're uh, stranded and not being able to have students come back into your your classroom, um, you know, your hard plan B could be to just start to fill up your intakes for August and September and October or whenever they may land. But something that where there's a probability that the the um, self-distancing and the quarantining will be laid off. Um, the doctor spoke about June 1st, I believe. Maybe it's August, September, October. It's really a bit of a guesstimate, um, but um, if you are not in a position to bring people into your school and you uh, haven't really well defined your um, your distance education delivery models, then that's your your next best step is to go and build up your intakes and then kind of hang in there um, till you this all softens up. Um, there's a ton of demand. There are all these people being laid off. We're in a recession. Historically, this is a very favorable environment for uh, career schools. So if you have the wherewithal to really perfect the, the delivery process on the distance ed, boy, there's a great opportunity for you. Um, the other little thing I, I'd want you to do right away is organize a three-week uh, online uh, program and it wouldn't be it would be free and it would be um, preparing um, people non-traditional learners to go back to school so when I was at University of Phoenix in the 1990s I was an internal consultant and that's one thing that those guys did and it worked exceptionally well it just got um, the uh, the students into a, a thinking of working online and getting ready to go to school. And it was uh, tremendous in mitigating pre-start cancels. And so this is something that you could do quite easily, a little three-week program, a couple times a week for three weeks. Hey, let's get ready to go back to school. And um, it's uh, uh, that works very well. And it can blend in very nicely with distance education. Okay, very quickly, uh, just a couple more minutes, Sally. Um, sure. Uh, phase phase two. Okay, now phase two is um, there is a point in time where this social distancing and quarantine work is going to back right off, and we can see that is going on with like um, Russia, South Korea, big parts of China are fully back at, to full employment after they've gone through this this mess. Um, Scandinavian countries, Canada, what have you. So I'm going to make an assumption that there's going to be a point where the quarantine requests, demands, and the self um, self quarantining, social distancing will be relaxed. And I'm going to, for the purpose of this argument, say it's June 1st. And um, and so you have opportunities to prepare now for a summertime that could really set you up well. So um, social distancing is partially released. Um, so the first thing you can consider doing is COVID-friendly classes. So uh, again, this is going to be a strain. However, you need to uh, do the right thing. Instead of having uh, your, your classroom hours in, in a limited fashion, open your classroom up from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. and bring three um, uh, tranches of students through each day and triple the room that they would normally have between other students so as to be um, protected. And and what, every hour the, the classes get wiped down. But utilize that uh, fixed physical plant that you have, uh, which will go in, it's, it's the right thing to do, and it allows you to start doing some, some ground school. Um, tie in blended learning as the new normal. So 
blended learning will require you know some work at the regulatory and administrative end to set it up but there are schools that do it exceptionally well um, and it, so it's an established business model and blended learning would simply be something al along the lines of you spend part of your time asynchronously learning uh, working off uh, video um, even synchronously getting on the phone together and then you come in for a two-week stint in the case of beauty schools to do clockwork or in the case of um, uh, like an allied health school to do some uh, externship or um, bloodletting if you're a phlebotomy student or what have you. So consider, explore the viability of, um, of blended learning. Uh, look to as a model to places like, um, well, the University of Phoenix have 400 odd thousand students on a blending, blended learning model. And so they, it's worth looking at. The benefit of this is that you can, um, in rural markets, you can actually pull from a larger geography where you have somebody who's willing to travel a couple hundred miles to come in and do a, a two week intensive and then go home to be with family. Also, uh, backtracking to remote admissions, uh, this will allow admissions reps to go to where the explorers are. Um, often, prospective students don't want to come in at two in the afternoon into an office. An initial meeting, they would like to have a meeting with you um, by way of a screen share where they're in their home at 8 p.m. at night or Saturday at two in the afternoon. And if admissions reps can facilitate that, the connection rate that they receive from the leads that come out of the marketing department will be much, much higher. And so the, that translates into intakes. So that is a really high quality byproduct of having a really well-honed remote admissions process. Um, in terms of, of advertising, this is very important. Uh, now is the time to use marketing and as it's supposed to be used. Um, if you guys go to the, um, go online and seek the book, uh, Scientific Advertising by Claude Hopkins, it's a 56 page book that was written in, I believe, 1927. Uh, if you read that 56-page book, you will know more than the so-called marketing professionals that are out there, more than two-thirds of them for sure. And what they talk about as a, as a classic and direct response marketing is that you need to properly qualify people by way of your advertising. So um, the, the reason the industry got in trouble were there were just too many landing pages and sales letters that were just overly positive and and flirting with the truth and you can't do that you know and and regulators are now forcing people to be honest which is kind of pathetic if you think about it so in your advertising instruct whoever is doing this work for you to be brutally honest and objective and laying out in, in a fulsome uh, manner the pros and cons of pursuing a a possible career through the education and uh, the pros and cons of the difficulty, the rigor required of going back to school. And what you'll find is you'll have fewer leads coming in, but the leads that do come in will be much uh, better suited to your school. And so um, I think that's what I have for the moment. There's other things that uh, we can share with you. If, I don't want to hog the, the talk here. And so uh, I'll. Uh, I'll just, uh, I think I'll stop. You guys know how to get us at Enrollment Resources or through FAME. Uh, and we'll, um, I'll just uh, give the floor back to Sally. Thank you very Thank much, you. everybody, for listening. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we do have a few questions that I'm going to address before we do a wrap up. Um, and some of them are for the panelists. So the first one is if a school is brick and mortar and they've now started a temporary distance education program, but the students not able to use distance education because of internet access or other issues, does the school have to drop them or can they do a leave of absence? And I believe under that circumstances, they should be able to do a leave of absence. It's not the student's fault that you don't have classrooms. 
And if they have the coronavirus or uh, taking care of a family member, it's not their fault. If I just decide that I don't think I want to do distance ed, I'd rather just, you know, play with my kids. It might not be as uh, such a vet, viable option, but I think in this particular case, I don't think the Department of Education would have a hard time with it. And usually accrediting agency would be okay with it also. Um, the next one is our payment period student specific since different start dates of students and student progress. Well, if you're a clock hour school, they've almost always been different. You very seldom have students in a clock hour school that all show up at the same time for the payment, even if they all start on the same date. Uh, if you're credit hour non-term, I guess it's going to depend on whether the student is taking some time off in between or what's happening. Um, they certainly aren't going to hit the clock hours like they used to because nobody's going to have the same schedule that the student had in school. I think you're going to be seeing uh, much shorter schedules than 40 or 35 hours a week, which you currently see in many cases. The term-based schools, the student should have basically the same payment periods unless that particular student can't come in and has to take a leave, which normally isn't allowed in a term-based school. But uh, you could do it under certain circumstances here. And we don't have enough guidance to tell you how to do it. So, but yes, probably students' payment periods and, and their time frames, the payment periods would be the same, but their time frame for getting paid is going to be different based on the student. And the third one, I think, has to do with Dr. Miranda. Can a leave of absence paperwork and contract addendum wait to be signed? Well, if the student's not, if the student is not at the brick and mortar, um, I, I, I would say yes, it could wait until the student shows back up. Um, okay. And, and I'll throw the, yeah. the, the, the thought in there now that actually, if you do have the mobile app that FAME offers, um, you can send your leave of absence through that and, and it's a legal way to do it. Or you can send your paperwork for your contract through there. But you know, if somebody has to be in the school to generate that paperwork, that might be a little more difficult. Um, and I was just told that we can get that mobile app now up and running in three or four days. So just as a side note, I have another one for you, Dr. Miranda. Uh, is NACUS now allowing us to enroll in programs through June 20th, 2020? Through June? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we sent out an email blast uh, this past Friday uh, announcing that. So again, as long as as long as they've checked with their their Title IV provider, um, as far as NACA is, is concerned, the way we read the guidance from the United States Department of Ed, this temporary DE you can you can begin students and enroll them even from the beginning through this temporary process. Okay, thank you. The next one That's is- That's been uh, confirmed by other individuals and Marine Wiseman and others in the department have confirmed that as well. Thank you, Tom. If we have a clock hour program that includes clinicals, but the students are unable to attend clinicals, I'm assuming this is a medical program, can we provide distance uh, learning for just the theory portion and have them complete the clinicals at a later time? So I guess it wouldn't matter whether it was uh, uh, medical or what type, yes, you can do the clinicals at a later date, obviously, because uh, if you're medical, uh, I know I was just actually visiting a friend who was in the hospital and uh, she was very ill and they, all of the student nurses were pulled a couple of weeks ago. They couldn't do clinicals anymore. So that's going to be true in a lot of, a lot of situations. And Tony, I'm sure it's the same if their, their clinical time, obviously, they're not going to have patrons to work on, so they're going to have to do their clinicals later. That's correct. And even, just as a, as a reminder, even if the state board for some reason is allowing um, for some form of a, of a temporary distance ed for some clinical work, um, I would, again, ensure that you're real clear from them, meaning the state board, what they're specifically allowing. And then again, I know that all of the patrons on the phone right now are all NACA schools. Um, the other accreditors and I had a meeting last week, and I can tell you firsthand 
that some of the other accreditors, regardless of whether the state is allowing for distance ed for clinical online, they're not. So I would, I would again, urge you all to check in with your particular accreditor, uh, again, for, for your particular programs, because I'm, I'm guessing based on the type of program that that will vary from accreditor to accreditor. I would agree, thank you. And once again, there's very specific language on several of these examples in the updated guidance from March 20th uh, uh, associated with the electro original electronic email from March 5th on the department's website. They specifically talk about clinicals and leaves of absence, as well as the June 1st uh, period for payment period, and also about clock hours in the synchronous and asynchronous environment that, uh, you know, not surprisingly, are totally in line with Dr. Miranda's comment. And I would echo as well a considerable uh, encouragement that the schools, obviously, across the board, focus on what's going on, pardon the pun, with their cosmetology and barbering board for all of those that are on the call. Uh, I was on a call Friday afternoon with Nevada as they, at the board level, attempted to determine how to move forward. Uh, they are one of the states, as Dr. Miranda alluded to earlier, that did not support and did not have uh, any, any support for online education in any facet or any form but we're attempting to move quickly under emergency action to provide that opportunity so that all of the schools in the state didn't have to close. Uh, but you have to be very, very careful. And one of the key determinants that they made, similar to Pennsylvania and other states, is that they were going to allow for the opportunity for uh, distance education, online education, similar to the temporary DEs, but as Dr. Miranda alluded to, it was only and specifically only for theory, not practicum. Yes, I, I, it's true in many states, Tom, as well as I think there are other states that I think Missouri is another one they're fighting to try to get some uh, temporary distance set in. Um, the next question I, is, what I, about... Just, oh, just to say, Sally, that again, people have to be very leery, as, as we've all stated, uh, to make sure that you're following the guidance of the individual states that you're in. It's not a one size fits all. Absolutely. Uh, what about LOAs for students that exceed 180 days, the maximum time frame? At this point, that would be something that uh, Department of Ed would have to determine at a later date. Right now, you don't have any guidance that says that you can extend an LOA for more than 180 days. So you would have to, at that point, drop your student, and do your RTT4 calculation, but I don't believe you'd have to return the money because right now they're saying that uh, you don't have to return funds if you think the student's going to come back. And if the student had any every, every indication that they were coming back, I guess you'd have to do something. But uh, if they're already on a leave for 180 days and they want to extend their leave, I don't think so. I don't think they're going to Well, and the interesting study. thing here is that's one of the areas where that is statutory guidance. It's actually written in the HEA that leave of absences can't extend beyond that. So this is one of those times where the potential flexibility that may come, and it's a may because until it's an active law, it's still a may, but the ongoing discussions of Congress and a great deal of the flexibility and latitude that are potentially going to be given to the secretary uh, and the department to look at options in lieu of uh, the, the existing statute and regulatory policy in light of the pandemic, we're going to play into it. But I agree with you, Sally, that after 180 days, it may be hard to keep the individuals there, but if the last thing standing between them and the ability to receive a certification is the clinical, you might also imagine that those individuals may well want to extend the beyond 180 days and go back and complete their education and enter the workforce. Right. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. But at this point, we don't have any guidance on that. So the 180 days stayed. Like I said, I would go ahead and tell them you have to terminate them and uh, do the return to Title IV calculation. I would not return the money yet because they've said they're going to work with that once you determine, you know, when the student really dropped. 
and at least wait a few days to because I'm sure we're going to see a few more of these, especially after they come up with something next week in Congress. We'll see whatever guidance we have in the future. Well, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to bridge that gap so you don't have to do that. Right. So. And uh, the next one also is kind of a uh, Department of Ed NACUS, but pretty much I think I know the answer for everybody, except for sure for NACUS. They want to know, would the Department of Ed, NACUS, et cetera, allow DocuSign for signatures by remote students? I think most of them allow DocuSign as long as it's, you know, safe and you can recreate the signature. Um, and again, you can do that through the mobile app. But Tony, uh, does NACUS allow DocuSign for other? Yes. So okay. it's funny when you ask that question about, you know, can students update their update their um, contracts and or do LOA. I mean, again, if the school has the ability to electronically do this, well, then that would be perfectly fine for us. But uh, again, not all schools are prepared to do that. So unfortunately, if you don't have a method for them to come in and sign it, then as you said, they'll have to wait until they come back. I, I now have three more questions about the 180 days, which we've already addressed. Uh, I, I don't see anything new. Joe, have I missed anything? Wait a minute here. If we choose to use temporary DE, is it all or nothing? Meaning if we have students that choose not to participate, must they be dropped or put on an LOA? I think my understanding is, is you're offering the distance ed and the student is well, and has the equipment necessary, then they should be participating, just like they participate in class. The problem is going to be possibly with some of these students that maybe the only time they use the internet is at the library, or maybe you know they don't have uh, the availability of the internet to stay on the length of time that's required, and they might have connection issues, et cetera. In that case, I think that would be perfectly fine to put them on a leave, but I think just to decide, I just don't feel like doing online classes because I'd rather vacation for three or four weeks. I don't think that is an option, but that is my best guess on what I've read. They haven't been extremely explicit with some of that. I know they said you can do the leave of absence, you know, if the student is ill or or, but I think if they don't have the necessary equipment was another thing, but I don't think you just had the option just to choose Sally. to come to school during that. Yes. Yeah, Sally, so what I thought I heard you say was, is this an all or none? So I'm wondering whether or not the person asking the question was saying, can we do some of it online? Can we do some of the brick and mortar? And again, I addressed that at the beginning and the answer is no, the temporary distance ed was only permissible for schools that are closed because of COVID-19. And so if your school is closed, then you're permitted to do it. If your school is not closed, you are not permitted to do the COVID-19, except if the student on an individual basis cannot come into the brick and mortar because they themselves have been quarantined or they themselves have the disease and so they're out um, or if they're taking somebody, taking care of somebody in their family with with COVID-19, then you right. could offer them the the distance ed. So that would be a, 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 an exception to the all or none rule. Thank you, Tony, for that clarification. I wasn't thinking that way. I was thinking you just had students that didn't want to participate, but it's good you addressed it. So now we've addressed yeah. both, both sides of it. Um, the next one is if your current LOA policy accounts for 60 days, we're only able to extend uh, to the 180 max without changing our policy. No, you can't just automatically change it if your accrediting agency has to approve it first. Tony's already told you that, uh, you know, you can send that information to them if you don't currently have a leave, or I'm assuming if you want to change the length of it, you'd have to let him, uh, you know, NACUS or whatever agency that has to do that approval process know, and they'll turn it around as quickly as possible, I'm sure. Looking to see what else here. Uh, you mentioned FAME has uh, formed partnerships with vendors, online testing group, blah, 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 blah. Are these vendors offering complimentary service to the schools at this time? 
I do know that online testing is. I'm assuming the others are also. Um, I actually don't know that answer, but I'm assuming they all are because we wouldn't be putting it out there if they were going to charge you during this period of time. We, we've tried to partner with people that are going to help you out during yeah. this uh, period. Can we use electronic signatures for leave of absence forms? You've always been able to use electronic signatures as long as you know that's the student and it's you know protected so it's only the student signing it. Um, so again, you can use it on the mobile app, you can use it on um, DocuSign or anything like that. Or if you have like a machine, but that's normally at the school. Uh, what about leave of absence for students that exceed 180 days? We're back there again. We can't do anything with that right now. Uh, I think that was answered earlier. That's a 180 day question. Joe, I think I caught them all, did I? Um, so let's see, it looks like if I understand correctly, if we have been approved for distance learning by state NACIS and we offer LOA, anyone who does not participate should be placed on an LOA until we are back in the brick and mortar. Extending the LOA with new form of the date if it passed the closures. Again, I, I think the LOA has to be used uh, carefully. Okay. I think, again, if you're sick or you already asked for an LOA for some other reason, then we can't exceed the 180 days at this point. But if the student is just saying they want an LOA because they don't feel like doing distance ed, is that okay? And I think that's an iffy one. I think they should be participating right. if that's the route the school has gone for the current time, unless they can't because of uh, a problem with their internet or whatever. They don't have a computer. They don't have. Sally, whatever. isn't the bottom line there? Document heavily whatever the circumstances are. I agree with you. I think that unfortunately, if the student is has no justifiable reason other than the fact that they don't want to go into an online environment, then the institution may be left with no other option but to withdraw them. And again, if, even if they withdraw them, if the student tells them they intend to come back when they're back in the school, they've made it very clear in the, dear, uh, in the electronic announcements that the school doesn't actually have to process and pay the refund yet until they know whether or not the student Agreed. came back. That's what I'm saying, document, 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 as you always tell us to do on everything. Right, Rightfully so you so. document it and what you did and why you did it and... Uh, Again, like you do the return to Title IV, you don't necessarily have to return those funds uh, until um, you, you're sure that student's not coming back. The biggest problem with that, again, you've got to go back to state and accrediting requirements because if they have a 30-day time frame for returning funds when you drop somebody, you have to be sure that they're also willing to work with, with you on the time frame. Thank you for that, Sally. Um, our next You're question welcome. was, if we already have contacted the department um, that we're closing temporarily and either providing um, distance education and we're already approved to do so, do we still need to contact um, the department or FAME? Well, you have to contact FAME or you're not going to get paid. Right. Because uh, you've already told us you closed. So when you close the door, we stopped your cash draw. So now when you're saying you're back and doing distance ed, it will turn your cash back on as you you know either have to pay new students or they get to the midpoint. Um, as far as um, notifying the Department of Ed, I think it's a courtesy. You know, they've said you've got state and accrediting approval. You don't have to have their approval. But almost anything with Department of Ed requires notification within 10 days. So I would just notify them out of courtesy and let them know, hey, you're currently you got approvals to do uh, temporary distance education. And as soon as you're able to go back in the classroom, you will do so. I did see one more that we've missed too here. Do we have Sally, to Sally, if I could just add to that, Sally, and again, for NACIS, and I'm sure the other accreditors are the same, if you have notify your accreditor that you're closed, but you've taken advantage of the uh, temporary distance education and you have now begun doing that, 
you should contact your accreditor and let them know that you no longer are closed and you are now actively teaching through distance ed. Not, I think I'm going to, or I plan to tomorrow, you, you contact once you have. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so it, there, there was another one. Do we have to get state approval prior to actually doing uh, dis temporary distance education? Yes. Almost always you have to have state before you have accrediting. There are a few states, like I think the state of Florida has notified the schools here. You can apply to them and send them the very same paperwork that you send to your accrediting agency because uh, they approve through accrediting. But I don't know. California is the same. Yeah, so there's a few states like that, but you would fill out the paperwork for both at the same time and exactly. get approved probably pretty quickly by both. But there are some states that it's state first and accrediting second, and there's no loopholes in between. So if you don't have it, then accrediting obviously can't go ahead and approve you. Okay. So the next one is, yeah. is uh, we only have to contact the department if we're closing completely temporary, either on campus or distance ed. If we're already approved to provide distance ed, do we still need to contact? No, if you're already approved for distance ed, it's not a problem because you're not closing. I mean, if you're not going to be at your facility and the Department of Ed can't reach you at that number, I would certainly contact them and let them know that, that you're only going to do distance ed until this coronavirus is over if you do currently do both. Because otherwise they may try to reach you and can't reach you. Or somebody may call them, one of those sweet little neighbors of yours, and say, hey, this school's closed. Did you know that? And they're not going to know you were closed. Okay, can students we enrolled in our April and June starts and the schools continue to be closed, can they start with distance learning? Yes, if they're brand new students and you are still closed because the state or, or uh, government says you can't reopen, then those students up to June 1st, once you become temporarily approved for distance education, can start getting paid under distance ed without ever attending the brick and mortar first. There are some tricky things to that. If you currently aren't approved and you get approved for distance ed and distance ed limits the number of hours that you can teach, um, as long as it's, if your clock, as long as it's at least half time, which currently is 12 hours, because for loan purposes, you have to be at least a half-time student to go ahead and um, certify the loan. If you already certified the loan and they drop below and you intend to go back to full-time, you wouldn't have a problem. But let's say you're credit hour school and you've always done campus, hard brick and mortar campus. And now you're doing distance ed and you can't provide at least half time education at six credits when they enroll, then they would not be eligible for loans until you got back into uh, brick and mortar. You could still get them, but not while they were less than half time. So there are some things that you have to be careful about with enrollment status. Enrollment status doesn't change after they've started until the beginning of the next payment period, as long as they're attending. But enrollment status at the beginning of a payment period is important for loan purposes. Okay. How okay. do we let DLE know we're temporarily closed and providing uh, temporary distance education? There's, no, you don't have to do a specific person. You can just email the Department of Ed that region, let them know. You usually have a contact person in that region, but if you don't know the contact person, whoever worked on your eligibility certification or your research or whatever, or when whoever works with you in new programs, they're usually your contact. But if you don't know them, you can just you know send an email and say you want to let them know. Um, what's the best way to notify? Oh, well, that's the same notification Department of Education for students who go missing in action and do not accept. 
uh, temporary distance education or take a leave, are we required to drop them after 14 days? If they go missing in action, yes, but it would be 14 days from the time that you realize what was going on. So say you temporarily closed for a week while you were getting your approval for distance education. Then you contact everybody and you tell them that distance education is now available and you don't get any response, you don't even have any contact. At that point, you would have to withdraw them starting that day, 14 days after that. That's when your clock would start. Your last day of attendance would still be your last date of attendance. But your, your clock would start at the point you knew that the student didn't come in and you were unable to reach them. Um, where can we get more information on the mobile app? Just contact somebody at FAME. Uh, sales people, Julia Brown, uh, Rick, Michelle, Stephen. Uh, would they need documentation for the uh, leave of absence provided they're not just wanting to be with their kids? Well, you're back to what do you require for documentation? Some schools just allow the student to say they want a leave of absence because they uh, have a personal problem with work or they don't have daycare or whatever. Do you require documentation for that? If you require documentation, you want documentation. Otherwise, you need to change your leave of absent policy, not requiring documentation. So you still want to document that you're putting them on a leave and why, but if you say they have to give you backup, then you're going to have to have some type of backup. Yeah, just again, just a big point there. Please, please follow your LOA policy. That's really important. And, and if you want to change your LOA policy, even temporarily for just COVID-19 issues, then you must submit something to NACIS in order to get that approved. So again, be careful, follow what Sally just said. Tony, the next one has to do with a student's schedule and them wanting to make up hours. Well, that's a good one. Um, making up hours. You mean, uh, I'm assuming via the, via the uh, temporary um, distance, distance education or, schedule, yeah. I would say that again, follow what you normally do at your school. It, distance ed, even the temporary, it's exactly the same as, this, as if you were doing it in your brick and mortar. Uh, the, the next one was, can you use digital software for e-signing like uh, HelloSign or DocuSign? I guess the answer to that again is yes, as long as you can verify it was a student that signed it. You have yeah, to have a way to, yeah. Um, asynchronous available to entrance. Oh, any options available to entrance testing since we've gone temporary distance ed? Sure, entrance counseling can be done online and you can get a copy that they completed it. Just send the student to the, uh, uh, to, you know, to the website and just like they do in, in their office if they're doing it there. They go in there and be sure they, they select entrance testing, not something else, entrance counseling, not just general information. And then once they've completed it, you can go in line, uh, the school can go in to COD and see it already posted there. Or NSLDS, I'm sorry, not con. Uh, what about new students needing to come and pick up their books and kits? Can they come clock in just to pick up their kit? No. Clocking in to pick up your kit is not, not allowed because, I'm sorry, Tony, I'm answering that one. Uh, because it's, when they clock in and out, it's to do some type of uh, instructional activity or educational activity, picking up the book and kit doesn't constitute that. I said the same thing to myself, Sally. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to put you in that spot. Oh, and this one, they, they just asked the same question over again, so we're skipping it. If the student's distance education, do we continue to award and disperse financial aid? Yes, you do. 
if the school's closing temporary closed and not doing temporary distance education, should we halt cash? Absolutely. You don't want money to come in when you can't disperse it to anybody. You'll have all kinds of problems then when you do your audit. And speaking of audits, you're all aware that your auditor is probably not coming to your school if you have an audit due now. They're contacting you, they're getting information from you, you're sending it through a secure website. Just like accrediting is not coming to visit you right now. You should not see the Department of Ed coming to see you right now. That's a good thing. Um, state agencies aren't coming to visit you right now. If you are not doing a brick and mortar school at this moment, none of those agencies nor your auditor is going to come to the school. They're gonna verify that you have a school, that you're there, that type of thing, but uh, that's all they're going to do. Can you give me more detail on the 50 minute requirement documenting? You want me to try it or do you want to, Tony? Um, yeah, you could try, sure, go for it. Okay, so you've always had to have a 50 to 60 minute clock hour a minute. That means butts in the chairs, basically. But because you're doing distance education, you won't have that. When you're doing synchronous, you have your student on line with you, whether it's uh, like even if you do a go to meeting or um, a webinar like this or something like that, and you, sometimes you can see all the people involved, um, then you know the students there. So you know whether or not they were there for 50 to 60 minutes. And if you're saying you use a 60 minute hour, not a 50, then you have to do a 60 minute. But most schools say they use a 50. So that's one way. I do know that some of the companies such as Pivot Point and Milady know exactly how long a lesson's supposed to take. And therefore, if you do that lesson and you scan in and you scan out, they know the, and they even have um, things within their software to actually clock how long you've been on doing the work. Um, if you don't have that and you're, you're doing something through email or some other venue, You've got to have interaction to know that student was there online doing something for that period of time. So maybe every 10 minutes you send out a little question or you expect some time of a response. This is where it's gonna get very sticky and the Department of Ed is gonna be lenient, but don't get sloppy because if you get sloppy, you're gonna be in trouble with accrediting and the Department of Education. So, you know, instructors have known for years how long it takes to do a lecture. They usually lecture a couple hours in the morning at least, and they know how long that lecture takes. And then you have some interaction with the students, some questions they answer or whatever. You can't just let that student log in and log out and never have any communication with them and never know how long they were available or that they logged in and, and went and played with their kids for an hour. You have to be able to have some documentation to show that they're accomplishing something. Is that enough, Tony? Yeah, that's good. I, I, I wanna just reemphasize, I would say that if I had to pick one, one topic that's gonna be the, the, the area that's going to create the most problems for schools is exactly what you just talked about, Sally. I would say because majority of, of, of our schools um, again, I know you have others that are on here, but I'm, I'm assuming they'll have the same issues if this is brand new to them as well. And that is the process from which you were engaging your students, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. It's just not, you can't just throw something together and then just hope for the best. The whole piece here, whether it's totally synchronous, which means that you can see them, you can talk to them, throughout the whole day and you can validate that they're there all day. So everybody starts at nine, everybody goes to lunch at one time, everybody goes until four o'clock, you can clock all those hours. Or you have you know, three instructors or four instructors doing the exact same thing for different people within your programs throughout the day. That's easy. It's this asynchronous one that's the one that's gonna create most of the problems. It's not as simple as it sounds, and it definitely shouldn't be loosey-goosey as, as some may want to make it sound. 
the closer you can get to validating the times that, that their students are there, the easier this is going to be. Again, as Sally said, you know, there are the, the Department of Ed, even NACUS, we're going to be a bit lenient. But again, the important piece is being able to document, document that each of these kids are getting at least 50 minutes to the hour on an asynchronous platform. Some of the platforms that Sally mentioned, they have a way to allow instructors, even throughout an asynchronous process, throughout that 50 minute hour, to engage with students at different levels in different places. And that's the, that's the important piece. Second other little piece I want to throw in while I have an opportunity is schools that have this temporary DE, unless you have a consortium agreement with another institution, you cannot provide hours to other schools' students. Please, I've heard this already many times over the last few days, and, and, and schools are hearing about it from other schools, and I just want to make it very clear, you are not permitted to do that unless you have a consortium agreement or some other agreement with another institution to provide this temporary distance education online, but it must be formal, must be approved by NACUS, um, otherwise it's not valid and it's wrong. Good, good point, Thank Tony. You, Ellie. I'm going to answer one other question, and then actually we are way over our time, so we're probably going to cut it off. Although we still have uh, over 200 people hanging in, so I don't know. Uh, the next question was, did you say NAC is? I'm good, Sally. Wow. However long you want to be, I can stay on too, Sally. Okay. No worries. It, it, Sally, I'm going to have to uh, jump off. I'm learning tons, but. I've got a teenager to pick up now, so uh, this has been excellent. Thank you so much. You guys are Thank you, amazing. Thank for participating. Um, the You're next welcome. question was, did NACUS uh, say they would not allow on online education? No, they did not. Tony's been very adamant that, yes, he's allowing temporary distance ed. You just have to pay attention to what the state allows and make sure that you stay in compliance with both the state and NACUS. And NACUS currently can only allow up to 50% online if the state also allows that much. Um, Joe, do we have to get off? Um, right now, Sally, I'll leave that up to you and Dr. Mirando. Um, I, I do know that we were scheduled to go until 4.30, um, so we can, I'll leave that up to you. Okay. Uh, the Why one other thing that I want to do. More minutes. Can you hear me, guys? Yes, 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 Tom. Uh, the one other thing that I would, Dr. Mirando and, and Sally, isn't there another one of the major issues, the tracking of the practicum versus the theory? And a great deal of the conversations, especially in light of the states not allowing for practicum to be part of the delivery under online or temporary distance ed, you know, there is going to come a point where the, in, in, the student could, in pardon the pun, in theory, exhaust all of their theory time that's true what is what you know and i've heard states and, and institutions contemplating well we'll just continue to do theory with them as no. the students continue to try and keep them involved can you please address that issue because sally as you just said no i don't think that's going to fly very well and i no. don't think the inst the students are going to like learning that they're going to school for x number of hours to only acquire a much more minimal number of hours of actual time in their clock hour environment. At some point, we're gonna to have to put them on a leave of absence unless the states allow some some other practical stuff uh, uh, online. It's just like the clinics for the medical. At some point, you're going to have to put them on a leave of absence until you know they have a facility available to go to again. Unless and until there are changes in the congressionals that provide latitude to the department. And at that point, if the department and the accreditor and the states are willing to loosen that requirement. But I don't see a lot of the states in particular, and I won't put words in Dr. Miranda's mouth, but I don't see a lot of the states that have made it abundantly clear that they are not willing to allow practicum to be done in an online environment to change their tune even in the in the despite the pandemic. 
And, no, and, and you and weren't putting too many you weren't putting too many words in my mouth, Tom. So that's good. The, the issue to be careful about once again, um, and I think Sally kind of alluded to this before, is again you must stick to what you've been approved to do. So your Amen. program has been approved by NACUS. The curriculum we we know what's in that curriculum, and what we are allowing is for theory and practical, but as as outlined with NACIS and with your state already. And unless the states change the, 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 the curriculum, then we're gonna hold tight to, to, um, to you all sticking to that particular curriculum. Because otherwise you're now teaching something that NACIS hasn't been able to verify and validate, and then that's wrong. So uh, this is a touchy subject. I think the important piece here is follow the state. Unless something changes in the curriculum, then I think you need to contact us um, and and then we'll take it from there. Right now, we're not hearing that. The only thing we've heard is that some states who didn't allow distance ed have now allowed for distance ed temporarily. There are some states that said you could do distance ed, but it could only be theory. Some of them now we're saying, well, you can try to do some of the practical, but you have to ensure that you're actually able to ensure competency through that distance ed practical. Um, so again, even within the, 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 the approval, there are some restrictions. So it becomes very, very complicated. So just be careful. The, the other thing, the next question is also a, a one that says our state is theory only and so our students will only be part time. How do we accommodate if we're only approved for full-time attendance? You really, the scheduling, I don't think is a problem. Is it, Dr. Miranda? They just change the student's schedule until they're back into the normal uh, classroom. That is correct. So whatever your contract says, if you contracted them for full-time schedule and you're saying that you don't want to or you can't, do anything other than a part-time schedule. The important piece there is, again, ensure that their student's contract has been updated to accommodate um, what is actually happening. So do what you say and say what you do, um, and usually you're in pretty good shape. And like I said, uh, clock hour schools, as long as you're 12 hours a week, you're still at least half time. That does not affect your payment schedule. Your payment schedule is always paid on full time. And if you only have a few weeks at the end of the program, at the end of the payment period that's part time, uh, less than uh, 12 hours a week, that won't be an issue. It'll be if you start the next payment period that way. And hopefully, pretty soon, we'll get some guidance on how to handle that portion of it because um, that may be a, a problem if you can only go 10 hours a week or whatever. I think this next one we've already answered. Uh, that one we've already answered, that one we've already answered. I think we've gotten most of these now. I believe we have, we Sally. Um, any other yeah. questions we haven't addressed, we'll, um, we'll go ahead and uh, create a document answering those questions. Okay, thank you, Joe. Thank you, gentlemen, for participating. I hope this was helpful to our audience, and I certainly appreciate your feedback and, and your participation, and uh, hopefully we'll all be back in our building soon. Yeah, my pleasure, Sally, um, and, uh, you know, again, for anybody that needs anything from NACUS, please email us, um, and uh, we'll try to get back with you as soon as possible. Um, and again, uh, thank you all for allowing us to participate. We are we are trying as a group here to uh, ensure that we could help as much as we can. Tom, it was nice hearing your voice. Um, and Sally, thank you for asking us to participate. Thank you again. And Tom, uh, Tom is giving Fame some information that we'll be getting back out to you again on the website soon on what's happening in thank Washington and keep us updated. Thank you. Everybody have a good day. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much, Sally. Thank you, Tom, Greg, and Dr. Miranda. You guys take great care. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.